Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. It is awfully hard to confuse Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, known universally for his civility and honor, with former President Donald Trump, the brash New Yorker, whose relationship with the truth at times is casual and civility. Well, Mr. Trump might consider that a dirty word. But listen to Democrats in Congress this weekend, and it was hard to tell whether they were talking about the former president or Joe Manchin. We all knew that uh, Senator Manchin couldn't be trusted. Um, you know, the, the excuses that he just made, um, I think, are complete bullshit. The idea that Joe Manchin says he can't explain this back home to his people is a farce. I mean, it's a farce in terms of, you know, plain democracy, because I represent more or just, just as many or more people than Joe Manchin does, um, perhaps more. Well, perhaps about a third. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the congresswoman, represents about a third that Joe Manchin does, but don't let facts get in the way of a good argument. Progressives especially have a reason to be angry with Manchin. He torpedoed their $2 trillion dream of massive government spending. President Biden's Build Back Better is done, and Manchin is now public enemy number one in the Democratic Party. But really, ruin democracy. Maybe, just maybe, the problem isn't Joe Manchin. The problem is all the people in Congress on both sides who don't act like Joe Manchin. Here's the senator explaining his Sunday morning political bomb. They figure, surely to God we can move one person. Surely we can badger and beat one person up. Surely we can get enough protesters to make that person uncomfortable enough. They'll just say, okay, I'll vote for anything. Just quit. Well, guess what? I'm from West Virginia. I'm not from where they're from, and they can just beat the living crap out of people and think they'll be submissive, period. Sure, there's a lot of process about this story. Manchin made the announcement on Fox News Sunday, anchored by Brett Baer, on the first week since Chris Wallace's departure to go to CNN. Manchin, the Democrat, comes from the dark red state of West Virginia. President Trump won it by 39%, as you can tell from this map, there are counties that are red and dark red in the Mountaineer state. There are no swing counties. When Manchin runs for re-election as a Democrat, he shows campaign ads firing guns. In 2018, he won by three points. That's down from 24 points in 2012. So fair to say he feels the heat from the right. Manchin represents a swing vote in the Senate. If he chose to become an independent and caucus with Republicans, Politics in America would change overnight. I have understated that. It would be like a nuclear bomb going off in Washington. Maybe the Democrats' wild hyperbole over this weekend has more to do with fear than anger. The White House issues a rare, blistering Sunday press release calling Manchin a liar just before Jen Psaki today walked it back. From the president's viewpoint, and I saw him this morning, uh, he's worked with Senator Manchin over the course of decades. Uh, they uh, share fundamental values. They're longtime friends. That has not changed. That must be tough for Mr. Biden to say. Joe Manchin just crushed the president's dream of a win before Christmas. Maybe the White House knows as much as they hate Manchin's power, they must respect it at their own peril. Ask yourself, what do you know about Washington's other most powerful guy. He grew up the child of shop owners in a small West Virginia coal town, then started his own business brokering coal. He still owns part of that company. It pays him about $500,000 a year in dividends. He lives in a houseboat, when in Washington, named Almost Heaven, after the John Denver song. As you might imagine, booking the senator these days is tough, but we've gotten pretty close. As described by Politico's playbook, Steve Clemens, knows Joe Manchin as well as anyone in Washington. When Steve was recently honored by the French, Manchin was there to celebrate. When Manchin recently sat down with a group of Washington insiders for an off-the-record dinner in a private room of Cafe Milano, it was Steve who hosted it. At a recent soiree at the French ambassador's residence, Clemens was the guy guiding the senator around the first floor and acting as a kind of gatekeeper for the dozens of revelers in black tie who wanted FaceTime. Steve's editor-at-large for our sister publication, The Hill. He will be with us in a minute. In the meantime, putting his microphone on as we speak is the aggressive progressive Chris Hahn. All right, Chris, uh, you heard part of that, I'm guessing. Uh, you think about how the White House softened its tone towards Manchin today. Was that in part recognition of just how much power Manchin has? 
Oh, absolutely. And, and let me just disagree with one of the things you said. Oh, Bill only Beck one Bennett of them? is not dead. Only one of them? <laughs> I, I'm going to pick... I'm going to pick on one because it's the holidays. I'm going to give you a break. Okay. Uh, Build Back Better is not dead. Nothing is dead in Washington until everything is dead and nothing is dead. So never say never. It can be resurrected, and I believe it will be resurrected. Now, I am concerned with the, with the senator's change in position, it appears, but I don't think that it's over. And I think that the problem with, with negotiating with Joe Manchin is there's not much he wants, not much the Democrats can give to you. The point you made about him coming from a very red state is a very good point. It's been made a lot, and it is true, and he wins there, and he's going to have a very tough re-election there this year. So clearly, he has issues that he has to deal with uh, and, and uh, at home. But that said, I am concerned as to why the president of the United States has not gone out, talked to Lisa Murkowski, talked to Susan Collins, talked to maybe even Senator Toomey. Why not make Senator Toomey an ambassador and then open up that seat in Pennsylvania for the Democratic mm -hmm. governor there to appoint a Democratic senator. We're putting too much in the hands of one senator from a very difficult state for a Democrat to hold. And you, you, and you know what? I, I can't just blame him. You, you're going to disagree with me again, but since I'm setting you up, you can do that. Flip this around. We all remember John McCain's famous thumbs down uh, on the Senate floor. It was 3 a.m. He killed the Obamacare repeal for President Trump and the Republicans. But in a way... He also got, uh, gave Republicans a, an excuse, a get-out-of-jail-free card for not repealing Obamacare and never having a, yeah. a health care plan. Does Joe Manchin give now Biden an enormous amount of latitude and leeway to negotiate, push something through that's far smaller, that's more popular than $500 million in climate and some of the other things that are in Build Back Better that's going to be tough to sell uh, in the midterms? It does give him that latitude, but he's never going to get that past the Democratic House at this point. They feel that they have been betrayed by Joe Manchin. They felt that they had his word on this. And, you know, whether they are right or not, that is how they perceive what's going on right now. Hmm. So, look, I think that there is going to be changes to this bill, and I think the bill will eventually pass. I also think that West Virginia, I know that West Virginia is one of the poorest states in the United States of America. And I am sure that that child tax credit that is in this bill will come in handy to many West Virginians. And Joe Manchin is going to have to explain that to many parents in West Virginia who will be losing this very much needed tax credit. Yes, yeah, the 49th poorest state, the second poorest state uh, in the union. At the same time, second poorest state in the union and a guy who ran as Scrant Joe from Scranton, You'd think the two, two Joes could make a deal. Yeah, there, there is something wrong with a state as poor as West Virginia that votes for a guy who lives in a golden tower with a golden toilet bowl. But yeah, I do think <laughs> Joe Manchin and Joe Biden well, can make I'm a just deal. Gonna put, hold on, Chris. Is, 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 perhaps, is perhaps the lack of understanding why people in a state as poor as West Virginia vote for a guy in a golden tower with a golden toilet bowl is not understanding that and making fun of them? perhaps part of the problem for the Democratic Party? Oh, 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 I am not making fun of them at all. I know the real trouble and the real problems in West Virginia. I also know that too many West Virginians are living in a right-wing eco-chamber that they have put themselves in for the last six years, and they are unwilling or unable to see the truth of who they are voting for and what they are voting against. And I think until that changes, we're going to have very many, we're going to have a lot of people voting against their interest in this country, unfortunately. So if you think about this, uh, the way the coverage has gone against Joe Manchin, you've been more charitable in the past couple of minutes than most of your Democratic colleagues uh, have been. New York Times headlines about Liz Cheney, a Republican who's taken a stand against her party. House Republicans have had enough of Liz Cheney's truth-telling. Liz Cheney is courageous while Republican men are profiled and cowardice. Uh, why Liz Cheney isn't a Republican proves the GOP is just a cult of personality. Uh, Washington Post op-ed, Distinguished Politician of the Week, What Democrats Can Learn from uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, forgive me, but I just haven't seen that kind of adulation for Joe Manchin standing on principle uh, over party. Well, I'm sorry. Joe Manchin is, is quibbling over, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars over 10 years and, or over five years in a spending bill. Liz Cheney's standing up to somebody who committed sedition and is getting <laughs> excommunicated from her party. She's standing up to, against Jim Jordan, who was involved with the sedition, who needs to be testifying before the January 6th committee. 
you know, Joe Manchin is talking about whether or not the child tax credit should be three years or 10 years. It is very, very different. And quite frankly, a Republican Party that does not include the Cheneys as a Republican is clearly a cult of personality. And all of those headlines are correct. And conservative outlets like the National Review and the New York Post should be praising her as well if they were true to their ideology, which they are not. Yeah, that's I'll pick the one part of your Understood. statement that I agree with, which is probably the last one, but uh, we move on. You think about it, President <laughs> Biden really wants to move on from Build Back Better because he wanted that win. He's not going to get that. He's going to speak to the American people tomorrow about COVID. The White House says the speech will be, quote, stark, uh, and it's going to be a stark warning, mm. they say, to the unvaccinated. Uh, 14 months ago, then candidate Biden promised this. Take a listen. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. And now your state of New York has had more cases uh, than ever of the virus. Tomorrow, the goalpost yeah. changes. No longer will the White House talk about the ever-rising case count, but focus more on severe illness and hospitalizations. You're the messaging guy. Will the American people buy changing the goalposts? I think, quite frankly, people who are vaccinated will. I'm vaccinated. I'm boosted. I don't care if I get a case. I know I'm going to have the sniffles or, you know, a mild illness, which you get most winters anyway. We have to get the people in this country to get vaccinated. And Boston right now is doing the right thing. They are shutting down all activity to people who are unvaccinated. You can't go to a bar. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't go to the gym. But the vaccinated, they can do all of those things. We yeah. have to start making it harder for people to be unvaccinated in this country because until we have a critical mass of vaccinated Americans. We are going to continue to see more cases. We're going to see more hospitalization and, unfortunately, more death. Yeah, we're, I think we're at a little more than 60 percent. As you point out, the, the restrictions seem to be coming, perhaps what President Biden's setting up for tomorrow. Hey, Chris, it's good to, good to chat with you. We appreciate you getting up. Steve is uh, shown up uh, from the Hill, and we want good. to just talk to him for a minute and get a little bit of a perspective mm -hmm. from uh, about his friend uh, Joe Manchin. Good to see you. We don't talk well, Merry, before Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, my man. Yeah, you too, as well. Hey, Steve, can you hear me? Can. Ah, Steve Clemens of you. The Hill. It's good to be with you as well. Read your piece uh, today in The Hill. Is this really, are we to believe all about civility between the White House and Joe Manchin, or is there real policy differences? Look, there are policy differences, but President, Man uh, President Man you know, Joe Manchin <laughs> and President Biden were on the same page on Tuesday. They had a very, very good call. They knew that this was going to have to go down uh, the pike a bit and be discussed next year. Uh, the president told Joe Manchin that the uh, size of the bill and the, and the perceived costs had grown, but he was going to get it down to the $1.75 trillion. They were on the same page. But part of the uh, understanding was that neither side was going to personalize this or to you know trash each other, no names dragged around. Well, you know, that was a big change in atmosphere and civility between Tuesday and Thursday. And in Thursday, they had agreed that a statement would be put out by the White House saying this was going to be done in the next year. But the White House uh, reached out to the pre uh, to Joe Manchin about, um, you know, a, a statement that would come out. And in that statement, it really targeted Joe Manchin. Uh, he has mentioned three times in the presidential statement. Um, and he said, well, Kristen Sinema is not on board. The parliamentarian hasn't weighed in. If you put a target on my back, you endanger me. You raise the, the mm -hmm. decibel level. And it's not in the spirit of my conversation I just had with President Joe Biden. So that back and forth between them caught it, caused a lot of consternation. And it was read by Manchin as saying, I'm not I'm no longer dealing with people in good faith in that sense. Now, I have to say, I've talked to the White House. They see this differently. But Joe Manchin felt they you had think, crossed think, a red line. You think the reason that Jen Psaki kind of walked things back, and we had a soundbite earlier of her saying, you know, the president still views Joe Manchin as a good friend on and on, is because they, wor they worry about how much power the senator has and what he could do next? Well, they need him to have a constructive, positive agenda in this country. And I, I know Joe Manchin. He wants to have a constructive and positive agenda in the country, too. And he does not want to always be the senator who's saying no. He wants to work with them. And right now, both sides need to find a way to forgive each other, to say, let's push reset, let's bury the hatchet, let's kind of you know, move in a different direction. Um, and that's going to take a little while because they've got to get over this, this bump that happened this week. But what I wrote 
uh, in that Hill article, which went kind of viral today, is exactly what happened. A lot of people are critical of Manchin saying, you know, why would he let such a small thing uh, make him torpedo Build Back Better? The fact is, it wasn't a small thing to Joe Manchin that personalizing this battle in the way For they sure. did in the presidential statement sent a different signal about the solvency of trust in that in discussing how that comes up. But I have a, I, you know, I don't know for sure. I can't speak for the senator. But look, I think there are, there's a lot in Build Back Better that Joe Manchin absolutely supports. He wants to make sure there are no budget gimmicks in like looking at how it's paid for and what he does put forward, what they do pay for. They don't want to have gimmicks, you know, around how it's done and they don't want to, you know, have sleight of hand, which is what he feels was part of the package they were getting, that this $1.75 trillion bill was more like $4.8 trillion. Yeah, no, and he, and he talked about that for sure. Uh, I, I only got about 30 seconds, but I want you to, wanted you to weigh on this because of just your relationship with him and, and sort of how he, how he thinks of himself. And we talked off the top about how much he values civility and honor. You think about the role designed by the framers for U.S. senators for six years from their state, elected by the entire state at the time by the state legislator. The idea was to insulate them as much as possible from the politics of the day and give them the ability to really vote their conscience and vote what was in the best interest of their state. Are you surprised or do you think the senator is surprised a little bit that he has not gotten any credit uh, for doing that or any respect from Democrats for doing that in good faith? Well, let me tell you, there would be no American rescue plan without Joe Manchin. Uh, there would be no infrastructure bill without Joe Manchin. There would be no uh, National Defense Authorization Act without you know Joe. Manchin. So when you kind of look at these various pieces where he came forward, he's been very critical. Mm -hmm. But we live uh, in a place that gets collective amnesia very fast, yeah. uh, <laughs> and I think there is not an understanding of these of these elements. Hey, Steve, um, we really appreciate you joining us and your reporting. We got to run, but uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Take care, Leland. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back now to COVID. Omicron cases account for 73% of all COVID cases in America. It's contagious, but appears to be less severe than the Delta variant. President Biden, as we noted, is going to talk to the nation tomorrow and how we should gauge our progress and response. Dr. William Schaffner, professor of Vanderbilt University Medical Center, joins us now. Good to see you, as always, Professor. Um, President Biden ran on following the science and being the adults in the room getting COVID under control. Does this move from focusing on cases to focusing on severe illness and letting the vaccinated go about their lives make sense in science? Well, you know, you can take the science and then when you translate it into public policy, Lee, there's no single right answer. And I think we're hearing the emphasis on a different syllable tomorrow and quite appropriately concentrating on the most severely ill. That's what the vaccines were originally designed to prevent, those serious illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths. They're still doing that if you're vaccinated. And I think that will be the main focus. Uh, how we go beyond that to try to persuade 60 million adults, our friends and neighbors who still haven't gotten dose one, that's difficulty. And uh, your friend Chris was saying, you've got to have restrictions on what unvaccinated people can do. I think here and there in the country, we're moving in that direction. Yeah, no, it definitely does seem like we're moving uh, quickly uh, in that direction. I don't know if you saw this, the NFL um, that had been sort of at the forefront of COVID protocols had to move three games. It looks like they may have to cancel games in the future. If you have a fantasy sports team, you realize that it's now been totally thrown into disarray because of COVID. Washington Post op-ed, the NFL's new COVID approach is smart for making money, bad for public health. They basically said, we did too much testing. We found too many uh, asymptomatic cases. So we're going to test less and play more. Yeah, they're moving in the wrong direction, in my opinion. I think that you've got to test to find out who's out there and who's ill. Because remember, these players don't just transmit the uh, virus amongst themselves, but to, the, to their coaches, everybody who works for them. And those are people who, although vaccinated, may have underlying illnesses that could put them at risk of serious disease. Yeah, you have to think about how the pro sports teams in the beginning were sort of setting the example. Now, 
Uh, they're setting the example uh, in a different way. Hey, Doc, I, I apologize for having to run. We're going to have you back soon, and I know uh, you're awfully busy as things are developing. We appreciate you being with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Anytime, Lee. Our pleasure. Bye bye. Both the president and I are vaxxed, and uh, did you get the booster? Yes. I got it too. Okay, so. Um... Oh, don't, 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 no, no. That's all. There's a very tiny group over there. Hmm, that was interesting. Some jeers for former President Trump and Bill O'Reilly after informing the audience that both of them had been triple vaccinated for COVID. The moment from their joint appearance went viral over the weekend. Trump later took credit for his administration developing the vaccine, but also made it clear he was opposed to any mandates. So what did Bill O'Reilly think of all that? Dan Abrams asking him tonight. Dan Abrams live, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here, following on balance. All right, back to politics. Manchin has all but killed Biden's Build Back Better. Could this be Manchin's first salvo for 2024? What about a dark horse on the Republican side? Plus, the richest man in the world has tweeted that he will pay his taxes this year. How exactly do you pay $11 billion in taxes? For the first time in history, we are able to do a story about how much money a billionaire owes in taxes, not how little they owe. Elon Musk faces a tax bill so high, he must write the Department of the Treasury 111 separate checks. And we actually, oh, there we do. We have what one of those checks might look like. Tax stuff, signed E. Musk, paid to the Department of the Treasury for $99,999,999. You see, the Department of the Treasury only accepts checks under $100 million. The IRS, according to the Associated Press, will no longer accept $100 million checks. The IRS will not accept payments that are over the amount of 99 million, whatever. The reason why is the agency has decided is because checks with so many digits cannot be handled by their check processing equipment at the Federal Reserve Bank. Musk owes $11 billion this year. That's what he said on Twitter. Do the math and he will have to write 110 of the checks that we just showed you for under $100 million. For those wondering, I will pay over $11 billion in taxes this year, he tweeted. Before you start a GoFundMe for the world's richest man, the tax bill comes from exercising stock options in Tesla, his electric car manufacturing company. So don't worry, he can afford it, but it also comes at a good time for him and every other billionaire because the president's Build Back Better plan failed this weekend, which would have saddled Musk and his rich buddies with an even bigger tax bill. Segments like this are notoriously difficult to book a guest on. Billionaires don't really like to talk about their problems because nobody feels badly for them. Senators and politicians like Elizabeth Warren love to hate billionaires but also take their campaign donations, so they're just a little bit bi bi biased. And you, the viewers, really do not want to listen to an accountant drone on. So we bring in Heather Gardner as seen in People Magazine, The Huffington Post, Yahoo Finance, and other notable publications. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Hi. Do people really understand what a tax bill of $11 billion is? Um, no, I don't think so. And I, I'm one of those average Americans who definitely does not quite understand the, uh, the, the magnitude of 110 checks that are written up under $100 million. That's insane. That's insane. I, I do like what we did with his signature, though. I thought that was pretty good on the graphics department. I thought that, was, that was a good graph. OK, so we've got this debate, though, and you've, you've talked about this before. You got Elizabeth Warren tweeting at Elon Musk about parent paying his fair share. Musk basically is tweeting out, look, I paid my fair share here, $11 billion. He's worth $243 billion. When people put those two numbers together, do they think that's a fair share? I paid $11 billion in taxes this year. Uh, can we go back and review all the other years? I mean, ProPublica uh, actually released a, a report earlier this year that Elon Musk, along with several of his billionaire buddies, paid zero in federal taxes. So sure, he paid $11 billion this year because exactly what you said, he's exercising stock options. Therefore, he has to, and he sold some, stock op, uh, sold some of his stocks as well. But you know, just because he did it this year doesn't mean that he's going to do it next year or the year after. And we certainly is not making up for lost time in the previous years. Yeah, it, it noteworthy that he owes $11 billion. The Department of the Treasury actually will take as many of those checks as you send in and cash them. It doesn't matter whether you owe it or not. We'll see. Doubtful that Elon is going to send any extra checks in. But 
it's interesting that Elon Musk, and especially if you follow his Twitter account, uh, is not necessarily one of sort of the progressive billionaire types. He's not the Bill Gates. He is not certainly not the Warren Buffett who says, oh, I deserve to pay more in taxes. Does that make him a little more problematic for the politicians who would normally embrace the green kind of eccentric millionaire billionaire? No, I really don't think so. And the reason is because, you know, um, you know, he gets on Twitter a lot. And I will say, like, to his credit, we're, we're having this conversation because he is openly saying how much in taxes he's yeah. paying this year, which is, is a departure from a lot of, you know, the billionaires out there. Um, but at the same time, we have, you know, his, um, again, he's not paying these taxes going forward. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren, he got in that spat with her. He didn't just do this out of the goodness of his heart, by the way. Um, he didn't just sell off his stocks because he felt like it. He did a Twitter poll that said, should I sell it off? And sure, he did, but it's because he had to. It's a use it or lose it proposition, yeah. well, a deal that he made with Tesla 10 years ago. Th so this is I'm get not in saying that he's, I don't think it's out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah, this is going to get into the weeds a little bit, but you think about it. He's saying how much he's paying, if we take him at face value, mm -hmm. no reason not to believe him, but he's not showing us his tax returns, much like a former president that I know. Mm hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. So what the government could buy with $11 billion, 33 new F-22s or four nuclear uh, su submarines. Uh, you could maybe just make the checks out to Northrop Grumman. Hey, Hannah, it was always good right. to see you. It was, this was great, Heather. It was good to see you, my friend. Talk to you soon. Merry Christmas to you and yours. And thank you so much, Lee. And you yeah. have a Merry Christmas as well. See you soon. The Ghislaine Maxwell trial closed today. The jury is now deliberating, but have we learned anything about Epstein's rich and powerful friends? Hint, no. Question, why not? Answer when we come back. Ghislaine Maxwell's future now rests in the hands of a jury. The ex-girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein is accused of grooming underage girls for the late billionaire to sexually abuse. She denies all the charges, but if she is found guilty, Maxwell could start naming names of those who frequented Epstein's homes and private jets, perhaps to get a lighter prison sentence in exchange for helping prosecutors in other cases. Ben Weeder, investigative reporter with McClatchy's Washington Bureau, who's reported extensively on Maxwell's trial, joins us now. I mean, there are big names out here. Uh, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, Alan Dershowitz, all have been associated with uh, Epstein. Uh, if you're in Epstein's black book, do you want Ghislaine Maxwell to be found guilty or not guilty? I would think not guilty. Um, because I think this is a playbook. If, if she's found not guilty in all six counts, you can imagine that the lawyers for every prominent person in the black book will be studying this case to say, how do we make this same argument? Um, if you're Prince Andrew, who's currently facing a civil suit in New York, your lawyers will be looking at this and saying, well, if she can beat the rap, then why can't my guy beat the rap? Um, certainly, you know, there's the possibility if she's guilty, she can, she can you know, reveal things about them. Uh, there's an argument maybe that she's out of the picture, but I would think an acquittal is what you're rooting for if, if you're one of the people named in the Black Book. You've covered this case so extensively. It appears from the outside to be badly handled by both the prosecution and the defense. It's bizarre. This was supposed to be a six-week trial. Uh, it'll be about half that. Uh, you know, the defense was going to take two weeks. They took two days. Uh, and the prosecution, frankly... Uh, you know, the women who accused Maxwell, uh, it seemed at times as though the prosecution hadn't prepared them for what would be considered obvious questions uh, about their credibility on cross-examination by Maxwell's lawyers. So certainly there's a lot of blame to be spread on both yeah. sides. At the same time, both the prosecution and the defense never asked those women about all these other men and what they may or may not have done with everybody in the black book. Why not? Well, I think that makes more sense for the prosecution, frankly. Yeah, fair. Because the prosecution, you know, their goal at the end of the day is just to convict, Mac convict Maxwell. Whereas the defense was trying to make the argument, well, Jeffrey Epstein, they described, they compared him to James Bond. And they're trying to, come to, to talk about how extraordinary a man he was. And so to some extent, you know, portraying the world he lived in would further exemplify that. I and mean, one of the girls talked about, you know, the fear she had because of the connections that Ep Ep Epstein and Maxwell uh, both had. Um, and, and how that, you know, allegedly led her to continue, you know, going back to Epstein year after year. Um, but neither side really probed that as much as you think they would. Because, you know, the power of Maxwell and Epstein 
can stem from their relationships. As you I, see a picture I, 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 I want to dig into this more about why Maxwell hasn't talked yet, because clearly she knows a lot. Um, could you read this the other way that if she's found guilty, if found not guilty, uh, she goes and writes a tell-all book, uh, you know, the secrets of the black book? I guess that depends on uh, uh, how generous her her friend her pals are uh, mm. in helping her out. Because you know, you would think she'd have every incentive not to spill the beans as long as people are helping her continue to go on in the world that she used to live in. Yeah, well, um, she, she certainly, no. yeah, she, cer she certainly, certainly has reasons for people to be kind to her and c powerful and rich people to be kind to her. Hey, uh, unfortunately, we gotta, we gotta leave it there, Ben, but if uh, we get a verdict, we're gonna have you back to talk about it, all right? Absolutely. And that is a preview to our next guest. He's gonna be with us in a minute. Controversial Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox could face a disciplinary commission for her handling of the case against Jesse Smollett. Special prosecutor investigated Fox in her office and said, while he didn't find any evidence that she or anyone else committed a crime in deciding to originally drop charges against the actor, he did find possible ethics violations related to false statements. Joining us now, Chicago criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor Philip Turner. Uh, boy, you know, I can't think of anything worse than a prosecutor who lies. It's terrible. It's outrageous. And uh, it certainly shouldn't be tolerated at all, not for, uh, not for any prosecutor. I, I read through this and, you know, the, the top line you hear, oh, you know, they don't think that the prosecutor committed a crime, but you just read through, uh, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office engaged in a substantial abuse of discretion and breached its obligations of honesty and transparency by making false and or misleading statements to the public. Right. Correct. Is that not grounds for being disbarred? It certainly is. And how would that quite work? Frankly, well, the, the, the attorney registration and disciplinary commission could bring charges as they do in these kinds of circumstances. And one of the punishments they could request is disbarment. And it, certainly in the case of a public official like this, in, in this kind of situation, they may. But I also add, I looked at that and I saw what was in the media. This is the kind of case that sometimes, or the sign of allegations that are sometimes the substance of mail fraud and wire fraud cases in federal court. I think if you look at, for example, the Thernos case, I mean, which is being tried in San Jose, some of the allegations against her are false statements. And they can be grounds for, you know, indictment, federal indictment. You, you want to so, put odds on a, a Biden appointed U.S. attorney going after Kim Fox? Well, no, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But, <laughs> okay. um, but certainly, you know, the, these these things are always selective as to who they go after and why. Well, yeah, the, the old but, line of prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. Uh, you know that as a prosecutor now as a defense attorney. We want to give Kim Fox her due. Uh, they categorically reject the special prosecutor's characterizations. Uh, while the release does not say so, any implication that statements made by the uh, attorney's office were deliberately inaccurate is untrue. Are we going to ever learn who Kim Fox talked to before deciding or while deciding to give Smollett that sweetheart deal where she dropped charges in the middle of the night and tried to walk him out the back of the courthouse? Well, I think if there are, you know, Freedom of Information Act requests that are vigorously pursued, that maybe we could get that information. We certainly have to give kudos to former Justice O'Brien, who was the one, was the catalyst to make this happen. Otherwise, this all would have been swept under the rug. And she certainly deserves to be uh, commended for her vigilant and just persistent action in making sure that this was brought to the public. Because uh, otherwise, we would have never learned any of this, and it would have been covered up. And uh, it, she certainly deserves to be commended. Yeah, you were one of the first people on national television to talk about Dan Webb and what an extraordinary attorney he is. Uh, he was the right. special prosecutor in this case. Um, and uh, that has proven to be true, as has most of the things and protestations you have made, Counselor. Merry Christmas to you and yours if we don't talk before. Okay, same to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Neither of these men are at the top of the list for the 2024 White House run, but are they quietly making their moves? We'll examine next. This border wall that you see behind us, is a replication of the border wall that President Trump put up. 
That was Texas Governor Greg Abbott announcing the start of Texas's border wall. The Lone Star State is building its own wall where President Biden left off. Close your eyes. Fast forward two years. You could hear the ad playing in Iowa with this video of the Texas wall. When President Biden did nothing, I built a wall of my own. As your president, I'll do for America what I did for Texas. Abbott, 2024. We aren't picking on Governor Abbott. It's good politics in Texas. The border's a mess. He has a reelection fight next year. It's almost like Joe Manchin from today explaining his killing of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. From West Virginia. I'm not from where they're from, and they can just beat the living crap out of people and think they'll be submissive. Period. Again, you can see the ad, maybe in New Hampshire. As a Democrat from West Virginia, I know it's lonely to stand on principle, but I have done it all my life. In 2024, choose Manchin to stand for America. Joining us now, Jason Nichols, senior lecturer at the University of Maryland, Dan O'Donnell, host of the Dan O'Donnell Show from Milwaukee. Gents, good to see both of you. I don't think I have a future in presidential ad writing, but uh, <laughs> Jason, any truth to either of those? Uh, well, I, I think both of them are going to struggle in the races in their own states. Uh, I think, of course, Abbott has a good chance in Texas, you know, because Beto O'Rourke, I think, hurt his own brand uh, with his presidential run. And, and it's difficult to run uh, against, uh, you know, guns in Texas. But other than that, I mean, Beto O'Rourke is still in this race, uh, you know, in, in Texas. So if you can't win your own state, you're pretty much not going to win the presidency. Uh, and I think even though he can say I built a, well, a you, border you can, wall you can, in you Texas. Can, Jason, I, I, hate to, I hate to bring up the past, but you can ask Bill Clinton. He lost his own state and still won the presidency. All right, that, that's fair. <laughs> uh, 27 years ago? Yeah, probably. You know, well, not yet. Yeah, 92 is when he won. Hey, Dan, uh, do you see either any any truth to either of those guys viewing uh, 2024 as a possibility? Certainly for Manchin, it's a lot easier to run for president in Iowa than it is to run as a Democrat in West Virginia. Well, it certainly is. But the question would be, I guess, is he going to run as a Republican or as a Democrat? He's all but dared the party to boot him out. He said, look, I didn't leave. I've always been the same old Joe. The party has left me. And while I do believe that plays very well in West Virginia for his own reelection bid to the Senate in 2024, which he's been noncommittal about, national Democrats are far to the left of him. So I would actually think he's got a brighter future in Republican politics than in Democrat politics. Jason, it would forget forget for a minute. And I know this is I'm telling you to, you know, asking Mrs. Lincoln how the play was other than that. Um, would it be easier for Democrats to not have Joe Manchin uh, as part of the caucus in the Senate? Well, I mean, it's it's a numbers game, uh, but if he's not going to support uh, a lot of what Democrats stand for, and he voted with President Trump 50% of the time, and I, I agree with, with my counterpart here, the, the white lines in the middle of the road are the worst place to drive because you get hit from both sides. Uh -huh. And we look at Joe Manchin as somebody who has, uh, you know, voted with President Trump, but also voted uh, for impeachment. And that's not gonna play well in, in Republican politics. So I think he doesn't have a home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think mean, he's, he's pretty much homeless politically. If you think about the last three Democrats who won nationally, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden for that matter, both Dan ran in the middle. Um, isn't that a little dangerous for Republicans if Joe Manchin shows up in Iowa and says, I can run in the middle, just look at my record? Yeah, I think partisan politics have gotten that much more sharply divided even since Barack Obama last won in 2012. Joe Biden ran as a sort of centrist, but almost by default. Remember, he's been on the liberal wing of his party right up until yeah. 2010, 2012, when the party got far more left wing than even he was. I think the nature of politics now yeah, is that you can't be a centrist. You have to I, run to one side. I love I love the white lines in the road. Hey, fellas, sorry, we got to run. We're going to be right back. Thanks. Everybody hates a winner, which is a Tom Brady fan is my usual response to people who knock TV 12. The seven-time Super Bowl champion and undisputed greatest quarterback to ever play the game. 
The only thing everybody hates more than a winner is a sore loser, which is exactly what TB12 was last night. Tampa Bay got shut out by the New Orleans Saints with a no-name quarterback and the defensive coordinator acting as head coach. This is the first time Brady's been shut out in 15 years. Tom Brady's been shut out for the first time in 15 years. His streak ends at 255 consecutive starts. 15 years in the NFL is like dog years. For perspective, there's not a single defensive player in the NFL today who was on a team roster for the last time Brady was shut out. Brady simply couldn't take it. After throwing an interception that sealed Brady and the Bucks' fate, he jogged over to the Saints' sidelines to scream at the opposing coach. Twitter lip readers had a field day trying to decipher what Brady said. The QB appears to have said, go F yourself. Whether he did or not, clearly it was not an invitation to play golf in the offseason. Back on the sidelines, Brady pouted like a kid, told he had to come home early for dinner, then threw the Microsoft Surface tablet. It was one of many, many bad throws that night. This one severely damaged the Surface and perhaps Microsoft's ego. The most powerful football player in history trashing her device is not exactly what the marketing department at Microsoft was thinking about when they signed up for that NFL sponsorship. It's too bad, really, about the tablet, a.k.a. the Surface. Brady could have used the Surface to pull up some stats on himself. The most stunning is that even with last night's loss, Brady has won more than twice as many Super Bowls, seven. Won seven Super Bowls. He's only been shut out three times in his career. Of course, Brady could have acted better. And no, last night's game is not exactly a great example for young kids. Throwing things and mouthing profanities never looks good. But maybe we should look at the situation a little bit deeper. What you saw there was a competitor, the best there ever has been, angry at himself for a poor performance. For all the haters out there who say Brady is good but can't take a hit, well, he does win, and that goes a long way. Winning's a good example for today's kids. So is Brady's standards of excellence. He is only happy with winning, only happy with being the best. That's a good lesson for kids whose rooms are now filled with participation trophies. Win, be the best, and don't settle for anything else. Can you imagine a young Tom Brady ever getting a participation trophy? Let me quote the immortal Phil Simms, who explained to a young rookie how to deal with the New York sports columnists and radio commentators who would come at a new quarterback. Just win, Simms said, just win for what it's worth. Just win is a motto that works for dealing with bullies at school and just about every other aspect of life. With that, we turn the airways over to a winner. Dan Abrams is next with my old colleague, Bill O'Reilly. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.